where you're from. I'm in, uh, I'm going to move, move out here. Oh, I'm going to say continue. Okay. I'm in North Texas and uh, it, unlike my friend Jeannie, who where it's 60 degrees, it is like 90 degrees here. So I am not getting all the autumn and fall vibes that I would like. So what I'm glad about is I'm hoping this painting process will help me feel a little more, you know, get those uh, fall vibes going. And I hope it'll do the same for you wherever you are. Um, the other thing I really hope, and it was true for uh, the last painting, I really hope that you guys will see this as a relaxing time. This is not meant to be stressful. You don't have to do everything exactly like I do it. Um, think of this as a jumping off point just to get your creative juices flowing. I'm certainly going to share exactly how I do everything, but if you want to change it up, feel free. Um, and, uh, and definitely, if you have questions, Jeannie is there and she can certainly um, help with them and we'll pass them on to me as you have them, okay? That's right. Hey, Marla, it's Jeannie, yeah. Jeannie Brigham. I'm the uh, marketing director for Windsor Newton and we're glad to be back together for another session, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we're um, welcoming new people uh, to the class. And like I said, it's uh, in the 60s here in New Jersey and uh, really starting to feel the full vibes. So hopefully this will get everybody in a good mood. So let's, uh, let's go on and I will be giving any details that you need on the feet. So let's, let's have a good, good hour of uh, watercolor here. Excellent. So real briefly, in case you haven't met me before, I just wanted to mention that um, I've been an artist my whole life, you know, always working with something. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with uh, Windsor Newton for a large part of my time as an artist. And I work through a program called the Fine Art Collective, and there's artists like myself across the country, and we do demos at colleges and universities. Of course, that's changed a little bit now, so, um, you know, it'll be other formats going forward for the time being, but it's been a great way for me to work with and learn a lot about art materials. So I'm hoping that I can, I'm really happy to have this format with Michaels to do kind of the same idea and just share some art information that I have and that I love talking about today. We're gonna do um, this abstract watercolor leaves project. Oh, and I forgot to mention the other part about me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> jumping all around. I'm a wife and I'm a mom to three. And so that's always a big part of my life and I'm very thankful for them too, but uh, happy to be here painting with you. So anyways, uh, this is uh, the idea that we were gonna work with to kind of get into those fall vibes. And I'm gonna switch so you can see it there. Make sure I can see that screen. Okay, so um, I'm using Windsor Newton watercolor paper. It's rough texture. I like the rough because it helps highlight um, some of that color variation. If you don't have rough texture, don't sweat it. Um, you can use whatever quality watercolor paper you have. Um, just know that the format can be helpful. So for example, I have a watercolor block here. A block is where you have your watercolor paper in a stack and it has, um, can you guys see that on here? Oh, yeah, it has adhesive on the edges. And then when you're ready to tear off the next page, you find the, um, where is it? Oh, it's back here. You look for this part in the um, adhesive that is open and you can slip a palette knife in there to cut the, ad the adhesive around the border. What is the point of a watercolor block? Well, any kind of paper will buckle when you get it wet, but if you have it in a block format, you don't have to wet the paper and then stretch it to keep it from buckling. It's already, you're ready to go as is. So you can put your block down, start painting, and it's not gonna buckle. So it's a really nice format to use, so you don't have to do a lot of extra work to get painting. So, um, that's what I like about this setup. I'm going to move this out of the way. Just get my block. Okay. Now, in the example, I don't know if you noticed, there was a white border. I like to kind of bring my image in. And I was starting to think this is just a throwback from one of my earliest jobs at a frame shop. <laughs> because when we get pieces, we always liked it if the artwork had a, a border around it. So when you cut the mat, you're not covering a lot of the artwork. So this is really unnecessary. This is just my personal preference. But I'm going to do it with you in case you like that look. And it's just as simple as it's totally arbitrary. I just decided to come in an inch. And so I just have got my ruler and my pencil and I'm doing very light 
lines. I usually do two per side so then I can line it up and just do a light pencil line from side to side. You may not be able to see it on the screen because I don't want it super dark because I want to be able to erase it effectively. But I just do that around the whole border. And again, not necessary. It's just, I just kind of like the look of it. Okay. Almost there. All right. Got my paper prepped now. And I'm going to work in this landscape mode. Oops, I didn't do that line very straight, but who cares? That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to work in landscape mode. And I wanted to mention the colors that I chose for this project. We're using the Winsor Newton Cotton and Watercolors, and they're really a fantastic high quality value range. There's about 40 colors in the palette. And um, these are the colors I chose. There's eight colors in the palette. And you can see I'm, these are called pan colors. Okay, I don't, this is kind of, I think, let me say it this way. I know we all grew up, Oh, yeah, sorry, Nancy. I see what you're saying. Yeah, you, you're right. I could have used, Nancy mentioned if you wanted to do the border, you could put tape around it to keep bleed from bleeding. You're exactly right. That's a great idea. I just forgot to put tape on the supply list. But yeah, if you have tape that you want to put around it to keep it from bleeding, go, go for it. Okay, <laughs> I just happened to do that. All right. So these are called cake or pan colors, right? This is kind of like we would have had growing up, right? It's but way better quality, those little sets that you get as a kid. And I think what happens in the US at least is we think of these pan colors as kid stuff. So we always gravitate towards watercolor and tubes. Nothing wrong with watercolor and tubes, but they're really meant for um, squeezing out for each painting session and not saving them on a palette and then rewetting. The main reason for that is when you dry it on a palette and rewet it, the glycerin evacuates or evaporates from that dry tube color. And two things happen. One, when the glycerin evacuates, it makes it really hard on your brush to re-wet it. So you're damaging your good quality watercolor brush. But two, you lose some of that color vibrance or brilliance. So that's why I really prefer to have these cake or pan colors because they're just always accessible and they're formulated to keep that glycerin wrapped into the cake. And it's also perfect for travel, as you can see in this little set I have. If you want to change up your palette, you just, whatever size palette you have, you just pop out the cakes and put a new one, or the pans, and you put a new one in, okay? So that's the concept of my setup here. Now, these are the specific colors I chose. Again, this is, these are colors I liked. You can use whatever blend you like. This first one is yellow ochre. And um, I'll just mention briefly, I chose some staining and granulating colors. If you're ever curious about the attributes of a particular um, color of ours, um, I looked at Michael's, they have some information, but WindsorNewton.com also has a ton of temp, uh, technical information on each color. So you would just look up the color, click on the color swatch, and you'll get lots of information. And for watercolor, you get really beautiful attributes like staining or granulating that you don't really see in acrylic or oil. So I think it's valuable to understand that when you're choosing your palette. Yellow ochre is more of a granulating color. And what that means is it's almost like you can see the little particles of pigment when it's on the paper. It's, it, you'll, we'll see it as we go, but it, it's a really beautiful effect that a lot of artists crave with watercolor. This is called Windsor Orange. This is more of a staining color. And all watercolors are going to be transparent to translucent, but when you're comparing watercolors to each other, some can be slightly more opaque. And the cad red hue is an example of that. And I think you'll see it if you're working with it or as I'm painting with it. Indian red is a more of a granulating color. And I just like that soft, um, almost a plummy brown. Paraline maroon. Okay, most of the colors in the range, six of the colors, I think I already mentioned, or maybe I didn't, sorry if, I, if I'm getting ahead of myself. Six of the colors of the Cotman, two, uh, um, 
and then two are a professional series watercolor. Paraline Maroon is one of those. I chose these two because they are unique pigments that just don't happen to be available in Cotman, and I really like them with the palette. Paraline Maroon is a synthetic color, which just means the pigment's manufactured in a lab, and it has a nice, um, vibrant staining quality. And then Aqua Green over here is the other professional series color that I chose. It's a unique single pigment that I just really love and I wanted it to kind of kick up the rest of the colors. So again, you know, it, this is just my selection. You can choose whatever, whatever colors float your boat for this. Then of course in the center here, Burnt Sienna, traditionally popular color and Burnt Umber. Um, sienna is a little more staining than Burnt Umber is, which is a little bit more granulating. But those are the colors I've chosen. If you have questions on those, let me know. I also think just, this format, anytime I set up a new palette, I like doing this because it reminds me of the specific hue of the color, but it also with watercolor helps me um, remember if it's staining or granulating. So I can just kind of remind myself that. Okay. The brush I'm using is a Cotman uh, watercolor brush for Windsor Newton. Um, this is size six millimeter. Um, it's also, this shape is called Filbert, which is a funny little name, but I like it. It's a good all-purpose brush because the head of it is more like a flat and the top is more like a round. So it's like if you had a round brush and a flat brush and they had a baby, it would be named Filbert and look kind of like this. <laughs> so it gives you the covering power of a flat brush, but the detail power that a rounded tip can give you. So that's why I'm I've chosen this this brush and Cotman is a good quality synthetic that's fairly durable and so and it has good snap and spring so it, it, it'll last quite a while for you as a, as a watercolor brush. Okay so I'm going to be freehanding the leaves and I guess because I'm right-handed I usually start to the right and go to the left but in a more contemporary piece like this you really want to consider the positive space and the negative space. Positive space is space where the, like in this, in this piece, are the leaves. The negative is the white around it, okay? I don't have any great formulas to tell you. I'm sure other people maybe online have different ways to, you know, calculate a, a really good composition. I just kind of eyeball it. If you're not comfortable doing that, one idea I had is that you could take some watercolor paper or car stock and cut out a leaf shape, and then on your watercolor paper, you can just place it and trace around it, okay, and then remove it, and after you've, you've blocked in your whole composition, then you can just paint inside those shapes. So that helps make it um, a little less stressful. So I'll show you how to do it. I'll do at least one that way. Um, just put the, my little leaf shape down, and then just trace around it. Again, you may not be able to see it that well, but it's literally just an outline of this shape. And we'll start by filling this in, and then I'll talk to you about how I'm freehanding, okay? So over here, I have my water containers. I have two really big containers, and that's so I can always have fresh water handy. It's really easy to get muddy water as you're working with watercolor, so I like to have the clean water handy. I also have paper towels handy because I'm constantly taking the brush and wiping it um, in the paper towel. And I'll try to make note of that when I'm doing it, but I usually have a paper towel in one hand, my, lots of um, clean water on the other side so I don't have to constantly go to the sink and refill. And then I've got my palette here, of course, okay? So let's just start with, uh, we'll start with my Cad Red Hue. I've got water on the brush to start. I take it to the pan and just mix it around. Water is the vehicle that drives the paint to the surface. That's just a catchy way to think of it. Because, oh, I think it's catchy anyways, but <laughs> because what happens um, with acrylic or oil is it creates a, a paint film unto itself. But with watercolor, you actually count on the paper to hold the pigment to the surface over time. So good quality paper is important, but then water is that vehicle that drives the paint to the surface. So I've got my little outline here, and it's really just as simple as carefully using my brush to fill in that space, okay? 
Now I've kind of drawn it in. I'm going to add a little water to soften that edge. Now I'm going to add more water and now I'm going to pick up my Windsor orange. And yes, this paper is dry. It is um, not wet. So I'm the only way I'm wetting the paper is by, uh, you know, with my brush with the water on it. There are techniques where you can wet the paper first and you'll get a lot more bleeding and blending, but to kind of keep these precise shapes, I want it dry and then I just add the water into the leaf shape. Okay, so that's how that works. Um, is that making sense to you guys? Just to literally just started with one color on one side on the dry paper, filling in that stencil and then the orange on the other side and they're bleeding together or blending together. You could call it wet on wet. So they're physically mixing on their own. I can kind of dance around with it and mix it a little bit more if I want to, but I'm pretty happy with how that looks right now. So this is a case where if you did this at home and you felt more comfortable mapping out your composition, you can certainly do that. I'm gonna skip that and I'm gonna freehand it. Again, no pressure, you can do it, whatever works best for you. But now I'm gonna take my yellow ochre and one thing in the piece, I don't know if you saw, um, there, as the leaves connect, the uh, watercolor bleeds together, which I think is a super lovely property, right? So I want to, I, I want to enhance that effect. I want that to happen. So what I, sometimes you have to give it a little nudge to make it happen. So here I'm using yellow ochre and I'm going to choose um, my Indian red here. And I'm going to just kind of brush this shape in. This is a fairly light. I mean, I don't have a lot of color in my brush, so it's lighter. I'm going to, I'm going to add a little bit more to deepen it. And you can see how it's bleeding into that yellow ochre. If I like that, great. If I want to soften it, I may just see I'm kind of dancing or a, what's the word? Pouncing with my brush. I think you call that pouncing when it kind of goes up and down. But here's what I'm talking about. I want that kind of that uh, bleed from one leaf to another. And so I think of it, I just barely kiss this leaf with this one. And what I want to happen is I want some of that cad red to blend over to this leaf. Now, if it's not cooperating quite like I want, that's okay. I can take some of my cadmium red and pounce it on my first leaf with a little more water and kind of encourage it to flow down into my second leaf. Does that make sense? You guys seeing that, how that's working? Is my big head covering what I'm doing? <laughs> um, but I'll try to lean back a little bit. So adding extra water does wonders for getting that watercolor to dance and move and flow. Okay. So that was the Indian red and yellow ochre. Let's, and by the way, there is no right or wrong to how I'm choosing these colors. It's just my personal preference. If you wanted um, what I would say is a little more controlled look, you can do a more concentrated ombre effect, starting with one color and kind of going down to a different color with all your leaves. I prefer this more kind of dance of lots of different colors um, bouncing around the surface. So. I am purposely choosing different colors for each adjacent leaf, if that makes sense. So here, for example, I'm going to take burnt umber. And I want it to kind of touch my first leaf there. And again, I'm just freehanding this. Leaves are organic shapes, so I'm not trying to make it look like a scientific representation of any particular leaf. It's just an my idea of a leaf. I'm going to take perylene maroon with my burnt umber. And here's where how someone had suggested if I had tape on this edge, I could just be a little sloppier. But you know, why make it easy on myself when I can make it harder? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just didn't put tape on the list, so I didn't want to use it. But um, I just have to, if I want to keep that border, just, you know, butt up to the border carefully. And, uh, and paint. Making sense so far? 
Right. I That's want really to get good. good. Okay. I want this leaf again. I want that kind of kiss effect. And so this time some of my burnt umber is now flowing into that first leaf and that's great. I just kind of like how they interact with each other, even if it's pretty subtle, like, I don't know, I'll show this. Can you guys see how that's pretty subtle? I still, it'll be a little more, more dominant when the piece is dry, okay? So um, be aware of that too. And that's what's really, I, one of the parts of watercolor I really love is that It'll look one way when wet, and then as it dries, you see some of the lovely haloing and, and dance of the two pigments together, how they will settle to, into the paper differently. And it's just an, always a fun surprise when you're done. Like, oh, cool, I didn't know that was gonna happen kind of thing. All right, so I'm gonna choose my perylene maroon again. And let's go, let's cut into some of this negative space here. And uh, so you can see how I'm literally just drawing once or painting one side, then the other. I can clean up the edge if I want. I could leave it rough. Uh, I could do one color, but I kind of like this interaction of, of um, two different colors. So here I'm going to use burnt sienna with my perylene maroon this time. And just work it in and I think I'm going to edge in more of the burnt sienna over here. Think of it as almost like you're having a conversation with the surface and you don't exactly know, like when we're having a conversation with a friend, we don't exactly know where it's going to go. Hopefully we enjoy it and we participate, but we, we don't really control where the conversation goes, if that makes sense. Okay, so again, I'm getting that kiss effect there with those two um, points. And we'll just keep moving, unless you guys have questions. But, all right, I'm gonna jump back to my yellow ochre now. And you can have these um, connect or not connect, you know, but I'm usually having my connect. You can have them connect at any point. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna stop that side there. I'm gonna finish the side with some of my Windsor Orange. Okay. And get that wet on wet going. Blend them together. And I'm gonna have the sides just kiss barely here. And again, if I want a little more drama, I just add a little bit of water right there and it will flow together. And let's see, I think I'm going to butt it up here too. And I, maybe I don't care if that flows so much. I'm just going to leave that. Okay. Now let's do, let's do another burnt umber here. And this time I think we're gonna add my aqua green. Just love how that aqua green just, it's not what you typically think of for a fall palette, but I don't know, it just really sings with these colors. And uh, I don't, I, uh, the Windsor watercolors just really, even though you wouldn't necessarily think that a, um, blue green like this aqua would necessarily look that wonderful with the burnt umber. I don't know. I, I was not unhappy with any of the mixes of these colors I got, to be quite honest. So I think a lot of that is uh, has to do with how the pigments will interact with each other without graying down. Um, they'll, be, they'll be softer mixes, but they don't, to me, that, that's not looking muddy. It's just beautiful color variation depending on the pigment, okay? So the way you keep from all of your colors looking muddy is you constantly have clean water to rinse your brush, okay? That's really important. 
water color. All right. So now let's do a CAD red hue. We'll have it come down here. I'm going to jump to some Indian red. I'm just going to cover that right there. And if I don't like my shape, I can just make it a little bit bigger. And if I want more of my cadmium back, that's what's nice about having a slightly more opaque watercolor, that cadmium, I can pounce on top of the Indian red and it comes back. Now check it out. So now that beautiful red is flowing into that aqua green and you normally don't think of green and red sitting well together on the surface, but that's going to make a pretty lovely mix when it's dry. Again, due to those um, beautiful pigments. All right, what do you guys think I need next? Maybe. Uh, let's do yellow ochre down here. Hi, Marla. I'm just getting some feedback. Just so everyone knows, uh, you could sit back and watch the class or follow along. It will be, it's being recorded and it will be available in 24 hours from now at michaels.com uh, backslash classes, which I will put in the feed for you. Um, and as we go through this, we'll share with you, Marla has on her, um, I say a little piece of paper that has some, 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 uh, some ways to be in touch with Marla after the class, which we're going to encourage everyone to, to post your final artworks um, at make it with hashtag make it with Michaels and also with uh, hashtag when they're new. And so we could share your beautiful creations. So, yeah, and I'd love it too if you tag me with your pieces if you're on Instagram because I, um, last time I really enjoyed seeing it and I reposted them and got good feedback. Um, from, you know, people on my site. So yeah, it's a good way to share what we're doing as makers. Okay, so. Marla, if, if yeah. someone's having, like if their paper, if their, their leaves just are looking too wet, you know, what would you suggest in terms of, you know, the. Yeah, the okay, so if it's too really wet. One way I know um, watercolors will often have like a sea sponge handy. I don't have that. Um, I usually just, use some paper towel kind of wadded up and if I feel like I've got say I, I want to take some of the water off of this leaf I just dab it and that'll help block the flow if you want a little more control than that another thing you can do is take your brush and squeeze the water out and then just gently lift some of the water dry it again and lift more that's another way you have a little more control over it Make sense? Here I'm back to Indian red. Well, the same would be true if someone's saying that their leaves look too too dry. Then you could just just uh, use the water, right, to bring it. Yeah, water. like so. Here's what can happen um, if you. Like with watercolor, another nice thing you can do is you can do additional layers on top. Uh, it's called, it's a glazing technique. And so if you have a leaf that's dry and you want to add color to it, here, let me finish this one and I'll show what I'm talking about. So this first one up here is probably pretty dry. So, or let's do this one. Say I feel like this one's a little bit um, soft. I want to add a little bit more color to it. And even though I didn't use Windsor orange in it originally, maybe I want to do a little uh, glaze of Windsor orange on top. So now that this color is touched dry, I can take that Windsor orange and glaze on top of that existing dry color. And that changes it a bit, right? And if I want to blend the edge, because 
The only thing that's wet now is the Windsor Orange, but if I don't want a hard edge, I just come in with a wet, wet brush and I add more water to kind of, I pounce around, like see how I'm pouncing again, to give a um, more of a visual blend of that Windsor Orange on top of this uh, dry Indian Red. See how that changed it? It kept the underlying color, but it put like a, a very a transparent veil of that Windsor orange on top. Kind of like you're looking like through pieces of stained glass. It put a, a transparent layer on, of color on top to change the way it looks a bit. Make sense? All right, I think I need a yellow ochre one here. So I'm going to kind of close this gap with some, you see how that's already blending nicely there, that was nice, and let's add some caroline maroon, pretty much I try to mix all of these colors together <laughs> to see what different mixes we can get, and again I wasn't unhappy with any of them, and you notice too, I'm not really doing physical mixing on a palette. I had it here just in case I want to make sure my color's not getting muddy. But this is a project where because I have such, in my opinion, lovely colors that blend nicely together, I'm not having to take two of them, mix them here, and then transfer it here. I'm enjoying how they're flowing together on the surface. Okay. Well, maybe you could touch on the, the type of brush you're using again and the size of the brush and, and how they give you different detail. Yeah, so this is the Cotman um, series brush. The shape is called Filbert. And you see how, I, I don't know if you know, let me do it more slowly because I kind of, sometimes I have to do it slowly so I can even describe it. So I've got cut my color on the brush and I want to do the outline. So what I'm doing is I'm taking, where are you? Okay, I'm taking the tip of the brush and I'm holding it up so I can fit as thinly as possible do the line and my crispy edge I want towards the outside, right? This is what I'm calling the outside. I want the crispiness on the outside and any fuzziness from the brush to be on the inside because I'm going to cover that anyway. Does that make sense? Sometimes it's hard for me to verbalize what's going on, but I want a clean edge on the outside and I can have my softer edge on the inside. When I'm ready to fill in the color, I'm using more of the flat attribute of the brush. See how I can get a lot of coverage by placing it down flat. And then, see how I'm turning it again to the side because I want a thinner edge. Here, let me show you right here. So this is the thinner edge that I can get. And then here's the flat stroke I can get. So I really like how this one brush can give me quite a lot of variety depending on how I hold it. If I want something in between, I press lighter. Does that make sense? I press lighter with the tip and I get something in between the two. The thinnest is on the tip and the side, and then the heaviest is straight down and flat. Does that help a little bit? So don't be afraid to twirl that brush in your hand. Um, because you, you want to use every part of the brush head to help you, right? It's your tool that you're using. You want it to help you out. You don't want to fight against it. So if you can turn it and use more surface area, do that. If you need a thinner area, try turning your brush to get a thinner point. I mean, a thinner line. Make sense? So I, yeah, I think I, I'm just turning it as I go, like here, I'm turning it on its edge because I want to get the, I want a finer line there. Is that what you want to, Jeannie, or do you want me to talk more about the anatomy of the brush, or what do you think? What are people wanting to know? I think you're good with that. I think that was some really nice, uh, showing you some good technique that they could pick up on. Good. Good. She just wanted to know what someone's just asking what the color of the last leaf was. So if you okay. just read yeah, it. that last leaf was burnt umber with a touch of yellow ochre at the tip. This is the cad red hue. Um, and you'll notice, I mean, if you're working with these colors and you have cad red hue, you'll notice that even though yes, it's transparent, it really it is has more coverage than the other colors. 
the Indian red does too. I think it's more of a, um, I think I, I have to look it up. I think it's translucent. Oh, and I was going to mention this too, guys. Um, or maybe I already did. <laughs> but Michaels has a lot of tech info. If, but if you need more tech, tech info, go to windsornewton.com, click on the swatch, and it will give you details like is it staining? Is it granulating? Is it transparent? Is it more opaque? And that way, then you can pop back to Michaels and buy it there. But the idea is you can get that tech, tech info to make more informed purchases that when it's more informed, you're not wasting money on something you didn't need, right? So I've just found the more you know about the colors you're choosing, the better you can plan your budget and get exactly what you need and therefore save money. So um, it's a good thing. And the more you use certain pigment families, the more you'll be able to better predict how they'll behave. Um, so that's something else to think about too as you're working. This was, um, my brush is getting a little muddy here, so I'm going to clean it out. But this is the Windsor Orange. Feel my, it's like I can, I have pretty low blood pressure in general, but it's like I can feel my blood pressure dropping even more because it's just so <laughs> meditative. So I hope you guys are getting that sense too. It's just a really, I guess I guess you could say it's a zen kind of process. I don't know. So I just put some burnt sienna on top of that Windsor orange. So check that out. Um, this is a case where the um, yellow Windsor orange down first and the sienna on top on that rough paper really gave a granulating look. So that's probably going to look, I, I like that effect. So I think that's going to look pretty cool when it's dry. So that's one of those kind of happy things that can happen as you're working. Let's get, uh, let's go to another Perlene Maroon. And this time we'll go up. I already touched that leaf, so it's that, you know, that blending or that bleeding is already occurring. I just love that color. I don't know. Notice too at the tip, you're using the tool as best you can, right? So when I'm brushing it out, I'm, uh, let me see, let me show it again. This is my scrap piece of paper, but as I'm doing it, I may start off flat and then I release the pressure on the brush to try and get a thinner tip at the end, right? So that's the other thing too. Not, all, not only are you aware of what side of the brush you're using, you, you modulate how much pressure is on the brush. Even if you're on the edge, that's the fatter thin edge, if that makes sense. And then I can lessen up on it and get a thinner stroke. So those are things that come with practice. But the more you're sensitive to it in the beginning, it'll, it can inform you as you're working. Um, and then it'll just become second nature and you won't even think about it like you're turning it without even thinking about it. Well, I've been putting down where to contact every, everything, um, where to contact you and where the class is being recorded. But when you have another little break in the action, if you could just hold up your card with oh, all sure. the, the details on, on it. Sure, I'll put it right there. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's being recorded. If you want to just bring it up closer to the screen so people will take oh, a look okay. at it. Because sometimes. Yeah. Oh, can you yeah. see it there? So there we go. You can, yeah. And yeah, also in the field. Oh yeah, go ahead, Jeannie. I'm oh, sorry, it's also in the feed, but as I said, it's being recorded. So as I said, I find this very relaxing. I'm getting into the fall spirit of things, especially here in New Jersey where it's uh, in the 60s. So yeah, quit getting... rubbing it in, Jeannie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's all good. No, I'm kidding. I'm just in the right frame of mind. Yes. No. We'll get there for about two weeks and then it'll be really cold here. So it'll be all right. <laughs> I can always move, right? So, all right. So that's burnt sienna. I'm going to add a little cad red. Just flow that on there. I mean, watercolor just paints itself. I mean, come on. It just kind of does. <laughs> Once you get going, just throw some color on there and it, it, it just is really lovely. I used to be really afraid of watercolor when I was in school. 
And I don't know why exactly. I mean, I had heard, oh, it's watercolor is so hard. And I think it can be, but I think it, it depends on what you're, what, what you're trying to do with it, what kind of pressure you're putting on yourself. You know, if you're starting off with a more relaxing project, it's a really user-friendly medium. Um, if you have a very specific vision in mind, it may be a little challenging if you haven't practiced with it before, but uh, I don't know. I think if you start off just doing projects without a lot of specific expectation on the result, you'll get your hand into it and you'll start to understand how it will flow and work for you rather than working against you, if that makes sense. And uh, when that happens, it's just really a pleasure to work with. So. Marla, I also noticed that in the beginning when you framed it out, um, some of the leaves just, you know, stop. So that allows you're just kind of setting the framework. So if you want to frame this art afterwards, yeah, right? Exactly. So you don't really necessarily, but I guess you don't have to. It's just, it's just, just like a guidance to put those. Um, Probably. Yeah. I, one of my earliest jobs was at a frame shop. And so, you know, I think I just, a lot of my work, even, even in school, I started doing large paintings like that. So it's just kind of weird. I don't know if it's like a, I don't think it's OCD, but it's just something that I started to prefer having a little border around the work. But yeah, that is totally optional. Um, and like someone mentioned earlier, you could paint the edge and make it a little easier. Um, I mean, sorry, tape the edge and make it a little easier so you don't have to follow in the lines. But uh, if you don't want to mess with that, you just want to paint to the edge of the surface, you can certainly do that too. Here I'm mixing the yellow ochre and a touch of um, Windsor orange. Barely any Windsor orange, actually. There's a little Windsor orange. Of course, you can add more than one color. I mean, I'm not, sorry, you can add more than two colors to each leaf. That's just kind of the rhythm I'm in right now. Um, here, I'm going to go back to my burnt umber. And let's go to turn around again. And there, get some of that bleed effect. I want to accentuate that. I'll just add a little water here. I want it to happen here. I can just add a dab of water there too. Sometimes, I don't know if this happens to y'all when you're working, but sometimes when I'm working, I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Like it's because it's breaking up the rules I already started in my painting, but then I'm like, wait, this is my piece. I can change it if I want to, if it, if it makes sense for where the piece is going. So even though it sounds a little silly to say out loud, don't, don't be afraid to change your piece up as you're going if, if it's taking you a different direction, you know. Um, I have to challenge myself with that sometimes. Okay, so that was back to the cad red hue. And I think now I'm going to go to my aqua green. Let's see how this works together. Usually it's not advised to put red and green together, but I've just been really pleased with most of these Combos. Now my color's a little muddy. I got some muddy aqua green, so I'm going to rinse it and then get fresh aqua green. I'm going to a much more cleaner container of my water, going straight to the aqua green. And now, see how that's a little more vibrant? I'm, I'm okay with some of that, but I just want to show you how keeping your water clean can be really helpful. Because um, you're, you're letting the color, you're deciding if the color is going to be soft and muted or vibrant based on helping clean out that water, I mean, clean up the water. So look at that lovely edge. It's giving you this unique kind of neutral, a mix between red and green, which usually can look unpleasant in like that kind of muddy gray, but both of these colors, this cad red hue and the aqua green, I think that's lovely how they come together, so. Can you bring it up closer to the camera? Because it does look really pretty. Don't be afraid of trying different mixes for sure. You could be really pleasantly surprised with how it's gonna to work together. And you know what? So, if you don't want to, do it different next time. Yeah, Jeannie. <laughs> someone was asking about brush strokes. So some people, you know, in terms of uh, how do they prevent them? 
Oh, to... okay. So like you're saying maybe when you're drawing a line, like it's getting too much of a dominant brush stroke, maybe. Um, yeah. And I, so let me show, mention this. I got a little dab. I may end up covering up, but if you ever get a dab on your paper, if it's good quality paper, you should be able to quickly um, get it up with a towel and a little bit of fresh water and just gently rub it and that'll at least soften it. But it's, you know, for this is no big deal. I'm just saying that happens. But yeah, so getting rid of your brush stroke, if it gets a little dominant, you know, what I found is you just try and gently rub that line work with a wet brush and see if you can soften that watercolor. Because that's the interesting thing about watercolor as compared to uh, oil or acrylic. It is never going to be a fully, uh, a fully isolated paint film. It, and what I mean by that is it stays perpetually rewettable. So at any point, you know, 10 years from now, if I came up to this painting and added water to it, I would rewet these leaves. Okay. This is why the long standing tradition for watercolor paintings and competitions or whatever has been to frame them under glass to protect them from accidental rewetting, right? But that, um, so just be aware of that, that it's forever rewettable. Uh, maybe I, did I get myself off track or did I answer the question? I don't know. That happens to me sometimes. Just, Jeannie, just let me know if I didn't answer the question. Oh, getting rid of brush strokes. That's what brush strokes. Yeah, so I just find, see how I've got the brush stroke here? I just try to really um, use the brush to get rid of that hard edge. And I will tell you, sometimes it really depends on the paper. If the paper is soft, uh, softly sized, sizing is a component that is in good quality paper that helps the pigment sit in the watercolor paper, but not sink so firmly into it that um, it, it gets lost in the paper fibers. So this watercolor paper is 100% cotton. The fibers are durable. It holds up to re-wetting and scrubbing if needed, if I were doing a different kind of artwork. The other thing is that it's in, in, uh, internally sized. So if I'm painting on it, I, uh, that first brush stroke I put down isn't going to sink so deeply into that paper that I can't blend it out a little bit if I want to. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but it just acts like a little bit of a barrier between the paint and the paper fibers. So you have a little more working time as an artist. If you're like, oh, I need to lift this, I can, you can do that more effectively with well-sized paper. If your paper is too soft, it may be that, uh, softly sized, it may be that when you put a brush stroke down, it just doesn't want to soften the edges. So don't be frustrated with yourself if you can't get the brush stroke to remove cleanly. It just, it might be that the paper isn't wanting to release that brush stroke on the edge, if that makes sense. So um, if it really, if the brush stroke really bothers you, you can come in with a slightly darker color and um, blend over it to minimize the look of the brush stroke. So that's something else you can do too. But really. Using yellow ochre? Yes, here yellow ochre again. Okay. But yeah, try not to let it get you down if you get have some brush stroking because it could just be the paper you've got. All right guys I'm really concentrating here. I want to make sure we can get going. So I'm gonna light I'm gonna open up my leaf leaves a bit. So you see how I did the entire outline that time. And and two the more quickly you can kind of blend the edge of the brush stroke that helps too. If it sits too long it will um one of the brush stroke will be a little more dominant. But this was the cad red hue with Windsor orange directly in it. And here I've got a little bit of that bleeding between the yellow ochre and the cadmium. I'm using the aqua green as kind of my, mm, what's the right, right word? I guess an accent color. Ac that, right, I was gonna say your accent color. Yeah, yeah, so that really kind of moves your eye through the piece. So I think now is a good time to put in another Mm -hmm. uh, the touch of that aqua green. So let's do that right here. I mean, it's an interesting question, but um, something unique about watercolor versus using some of the other mediums like acrylic is that you really can't, someone's asking about preserving it. I mean, mm. because, because, you know, 
it obviously by virtue it's water so water you can't you shouldn't get on it it's basically just preserving and putting it under glass is the only thing because you can't there aren't any varnishes that you use um right. in watercolor to set it would that yeah be true? exactly and yeah it's, i mean chem physically you could there are artists who decide to flout convention and put like an acrylic varnish on top of their watercolor and that's there's nothing chemically wrong with doing that and what that will do is it will kind of freeze that watercolor on the surface but uh, most competitions or watercolor societies or whatnot don't want that because what a top coat does also is it it will really darken the watercolor and you're not seeing the true attributes of the color at that point when you've got an acrylic varnish on top of it so while it protects it from being re-wet you've darkened the color and kind of damaged some of the integrity of it being a pure watercolor piece again that's if you want to follow those rules or not and you know artists are good about coming up with their own rules so i just mention it because that has been a standard right well, but with anything any techniques it's always best to trial it on a small scale before you okay. go through the investment yeah. <laughs> give yourself That's a swatch nice. see how you like it you know because good. rather than making a huge investment in time and product and effort mm -hmm. it's always best to do it like a little trial right totally very good point yes always test it if you're breaking out with something new no, 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 no. All right, let's go back to cadmium here. Okay, one other thing regarding the brushes, you know, someone's asking mm -hmm. about the differences between using them just for watercolor or using them for other mm -hmm. mediums like acrylic and how to preserve and um, clean and preserve them. Yeah, good so question. Watercolor, yeah, so why don't you just talk to a little bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, while there's expense involved up front, ideally it's nice if you can have a separate set of watercolor brushes compared to acrylic, compared to oil, if you're gonna use all those media. Because um, different paint mediums like oil or acrylic are gonna leave, no matter how fastidious you are at cleaning, they're gonna leave some residue in your brush. And so you don't, especially with watercolor, you don't want that sullying, it up, sullying up the fibers and uh, ruining the texture of the brush filament for watercolor. So you wanna keep a separate stash of watercolor brushes. Doesn't have to be a lot, just whatever you can, you know, good quality brushes um, that don't break the bank that you can keep separate from acrylic or oil is a good start. Then for cleaning watercolor brushes, um, obviously clean it in um, water uh, after your painting session. And if you're just taking a break, that's good enough. But if you're if you're done for the day, you can go back and um, uh, go to the sink and just wash it with a little bit of gentle soap, and that will help um, clean it too and prepare it for your next painting session. Um, I know sometimes artists will use different things like hair conditioner, things like that, to preserve it. I've been taught to advise against that, and the reason why is some of those hair products. While they may indeed help condition the brush, they, those residues can stay in the, in the brush hairs and inhibit the performance of the brush. So kind of defeats the purpose if it helps the hair follicle or the hair, hair filaments, but then it affects your brush performance. So um, typically advise against something like that. Okay, I'm getting there, getting there. Think of it as breaking up that negative space. Well, I can see that you're really pulling it all together. We have a couple more leaves to add. Um, we're going to probably get close to our finishing time. Um, finishing on time, I should say. So I just wanted to reiterate a couple things. So to rest assured that whatever you you saw or if you miss marla if you could just pull back <laughs> your head oh, is actually head. covered up oh. <laughs> right sorry about that technical right this is this is yeah. live so these things happen <laughs> anyhow um <laughs> we're going to it's everything is being recorded it'll be available in 24 hours from now michaels.com backslash classes the same way that you registered 
you'll be able to go back on the Michael's website and see um, all these classes at your watch them at your own leisure time or look back to refresh. Um, what I would suggest to share your art creations with us because we love to see it um, on my hashtag make it with Michaels and also hashtag Windsor and Newton. Um, lastly, I would say that Marla can be followed at Marla Morrison Art um, and then or at uh, TFAC, T F A C N A, which is that fine art collective we refer to that she's part of. Um, yes. And really, we just really appreciate everyone um, to participate. There will be a survey that's coming after the class. And with that, it'll give us just some insights, give us some great feedback. You know, you're gonna be rating, you know, the, the, the whole experience so that we could give you the types of um, classes that you that you're really want. And then we could curate um, some of these classes to things that everyone really would, uh, really is like not only learning, but has some aspirations to learn about. So I just wanna thank Marla. This is really coming together nicely. Good. Good. And uh, I could see it coming to life. There's a few more leaves. And like I said, everyone's been really favorable. Quiet class, I have to say. So everyone's intently working, as I could see. <laughs> so that's good. Good thing. That's good. good thing. I was going to show too. I think, what do you think? I think this is finishes it out for pretty good for now. But I wanted to show a couple of other options, if that's OK, um, that you can use these colors do and kind of so like this is an example of going to the edge doing the painting first coming back on a different day and doing a second layer on top if you want to add even more layers of leaves and have more of those leaves taking up that negative space so that's an idea and then when I was thinking about tracing things I was collecting leaves and I realized how easy it is to pick up a leaf, trace around it, and then just add these colors into the um, stenciled area to make your own kind of um, leaf painting just by blending these colors that we were using just a moment ago. And then here's another leaf and an example. So just know that sky's the limit with all the different things you can do with these colors and this concept of eight colors and thinking about leaves so i mean lots of different things you can do and you don't even have to keep it to this shape but it was a really good um starting point so i hope that you will take these tips and take them out in the world and and enjoy some painting time and and have fun with it and autumn will be here soon even in texas so <laughs> wherever you are i hope that's true for you too but i really thank you for spending your time with me today and i had a great time doing it too. Best to you and take care.